the talk, everybody. Uh, my talk is called Misconfigured Cores and Why Being Secure Isn't Getting Easier. Uh, and it is kind of a talk where I kind of talk about one specific problem and, um, and then look at how it's, there's a lot of problems and it's this one problem, uh, which is misconfigured cores, uh, has one root problem that is, uh, it's getting really big in the web application security world. And, uh, it should be fun, uh, cause, uh, kind of looking at the internet as a whole is fun. Uh, so, uh, about me, my name is Evan. I'm a software engineer, uh, but I work on product security at Cloudflare. And if you're not familiar with uh, what Cloudflare is, it's a giant reverse proxy, giant network. And uh, at, I don't know what uh, we advertise, but at any time we're doing like a billion, we're our customers, we're a giant proxy, and uh, we're dealing with over a billion requests every like 15 to 20 minutes. So the scale is really big, and we have a lot of customers, millions of sites uh, that, that use us as a CDN. So it's, uh, uh, looking at the internet as a whole is like kind of comes with the job description. And so, uh, the first, first thing is, uh, start off with a question and it's not a good question. It's, uh, how would you secure the internet? And, uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> if anybody knows, like, we can just all go home. Uh, yeah, that'll work. Uh, so it's a lofty and idealistic goal, uh, and it's not really attainable because there's uh, core problems, fundamental issues with how the internet works. There's BGP uh, hijacking and route leaks. There's problems with DNS and even TLS, which everybody knows is a good thing, uh, is really bad. Just you rely on every single CA in your trust store to be honest and not issue rogue certificates. And so they're like, this is not something that we can do. Uh, and so uh, at work, we want to make the internet secure though. That is, uh, that's one thing that one of my goals when I go to work is like, how can I improve things for the internet? And, um, and so the, the question shouldn't be, how would you secure the internet? It's like, how would you improve the security? Uh, how would you make a dent in the internet? How would you, how would you help it? Uh, and so, uh, kind of having a lot of websites, uh, on, on our product, we kind of, um, look at how we can help a lot of small mom and pop shops is, uh, the, usually the end receiver of the work that we do. So like, uh, we gave away TLS and we gave that to all of our customers for free. And, and so thinking in that realm, how can we make the security better for everybody? And, um, I don't know, it's, it's just important when thinking about questions like this, uh, to consider, I guess, the little people, uh, just because they're the, People on the internet who, like, you go to New York Times, you go to um, Amazon.com, you go to Facebook.com, and these these are secure sites. And your mom and pop shop that you order pizza from, uh, they they don't have a security budget. They don't have uh, a web developer probably. And so, uh, helping them would drastically, a lot of them would drastically raise the bar. And so, uh, this is. This is a castle and it gets used in, uh, security metaphors all the time. Like, we want to build a castle. It's got a strong foundation. It's got lots of walls and it's, uh, it's, it's big and mature and that's kind of the Facebook and Google and Amazon and Apple. That's, that's them. And that's not what everybody else has. Uh, this is the, your typical site in the Alexa 1 million, security-wise. And, and in a lot of other ways, like uh, usability and 
uh, like there's a famous blog post, the web obesity crisis, talking about how the average, the average page has gone up in by many, many megabytes that you download. It, page, web, web pages are massive these days because of all the images and everything. In security wise, it's the same thing. People are installing WordPress plugins that they have no idea what they do. People are just, uh, yeah, so I think it's, we all kind of understand how this happens, how, how security for a lot of these small companies, uh, uh is not, is not comparable to the security for like a Facebook or a Google where they have invested in hundreds and hundreds of security engineers. Uh, so, so, uh, yeah, so I guess let's start with, uh, talking about things more than policy, which is, uh, the foundation. If you're a web application security person, you have undoubtedly come across same origin policy. It's the foundation and linchpin of security on the internet. And, uh, and it's, it, all it says is, um, well, it's not all it says, but example1.com cannot load data from example2.com, uh, by default. Uh, that would be terrible if it could. That, that's like the worst thing that can happen on the internet. Uh, if, if, if this same origin policy thing didn't exist. And, um, This is, um, just lost my train of thought. Uh, not everybody, not everybody wants this. Like some people, uh, you might own example two. Example one.com might be a company that owns example two.com. And so this is, uh, this kind of prompted something which is a subject of my talk called cores, cross origin resource sharing. And it's, uh, cores is a way to poke holes in same origin policy and allow this, this type of communication for, for example one.com to communicate in your browser with, uh, example two, uh, some other site. Um, and this is kind of what cores looks like. So example.com requests example.api.com and, uh, it, it might be a little hard to see, but it says, uh, under the bottom arrow, there's a, there's, there's two important headers here. So the top is a HTTP request from example to example API, and it says git, uh, they're getting some info, and the origin header, example.com, uh, it says where it's coming from. And then examleapi.com responds with access control allow origin. And this is the mechanism through which cores works. It's, uh, it's header based, like everything HTTP. Um, And there, there are good reasons for, there's a lot of configurations in cores and uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them. There's only one that we really care about and uh, so the important thing, one, one of the things that's important to know is cores is driven by the origin of it. If you look here, wrong screen, you see example.com. Uh, this is automatically attached to cross origin requests by, by the browser. And, um, and that's how examleapi.com knows what headers to return, what cores headers to return this access control allow origin, uh, header. And, uh, so based on the origin header that is in the HTTP request, you get back some policy about, about cross origin resource sharing. And the other important thing to know, is that star has a special meaning. And, uh, star, uh, you'll notice that in my example here, star is returned. And that means anybody, you're open to the world. Anybody can talk to you. But, uh, nobody can send cookies. And that is, um, very important to note. That star means open, allow all. And that kind of, this, it's, it's important to think of cores at this point as like a way to poke through, um, same origin policy. Uh, 
and and this star thing was was meant to do an allow all, but but not have developers shoot themselves in the foot by turning off same origin policy, and uh, and so this this is pretty interesting. So here's a real world cores uh, cores header. I'm there's a HTTP request to fetch some Google jQuery library, jQuery.min.js from uh, their Google CDN. And Google says, access control, allow origin star. So this is open to the world for JavaScript to, to download this JavaScript and use the JavaScript. And uh, and it's star. So, um, uh, so no cookies. And here is... This is the other important case that that we're about to talk a lot more about. So this is actually Fastly.com. They're a uh, Cloudflare competitor. They're only, I only have them on the slide because I knew that they did this on their website. But uh, <laughs> they, uh, so based on this origin header, uh, www.fastly.com, uh, I'm requesting app.fastly.com, and app.fastly.com says www.fastly.com can communicate with uh, with me, and credentials are allowed. So you can pass cookies between these two sites. And that's completely reasonable. This is like exactly what Cores was made to do. Uh, but I think that it, um, it might not be obvious at first, but using Cores, you can turn off, uh, you can still turn off same origin policy. And uh, there's reflecting all origin headers as access control allow origin and always saying access control allow credentials true would be really bad. That is, that is defeating the whole point of same origin policy that, that the people 25 years ago when they were building the web, uh, created, uh, Created it for, and so I think um, I was I was playing with cores one day, and I just thought, like, I wonder how many people do this. Uh, it seems like something that someone had to have done accidentally, and I wonder how widespread it is. And I thought about this uh, maybe eight months ago or something, and so I scanned it. I scanned the Alexa one million for for this problem, and. Uh, yeah, I already talked about that. And so, uh, yeah, so this is what, uh, this is why it would be so bad. I, I don't think I've explained this yet. So, uh, turning off same origin policy, if it didn't exist, you'd go log into your bank account, uh, you'd have your bank cookie, then you'd go to an evil website, and your evil website could just like make requests to your bank and steal your bank data. It's trivially easy. And, uh, here, here's the bank has these two headers, access control, allow origin, evil, access control, allow credentials, true. And it's, uh, if, if this was real, this would be really bad. It's clearly not real. This is an awful bank. They're returning latitude and longitude information and not banking information. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is what the problem would look like in the real world if it existed. And so, uh, Testing for it, very easy. We've I just showed you some curl requests. It's very easy to do. You just add a dash page uh, for the site and add an origin. And curl is great for one one request if you're testing one site, but it's not well suited if you're going to scan the Alexa one million. So I had to break out some bigger firepower. But curl has been my best friend uh, while doing this research. Um, and here here's an example of someone who I got with it. So this is one of the first sites, streamable.com. They're a video, uh, some kind of video, they're fast video provider of like little clips. I've come across them while browsing Reddit a lot. And, uh, and this got patched at like 11.30 last night. Uh, I reported it to the CEO and, uh, he said thanks. And then a couple weeks went by and nothing had changed, uh, so I emailed him again last night, and within like three minutes, it was fixed. So, yeah, we just forgot. But uh, yeah, so I had a proof of concept that so I I exploited it with curl, but then I I needed a real exploit to 
to show how an evil website would do it. And it, this is a, it. It's just like a little bit of JavaScript. Uh, Ajax, you send a Git request to Streamable of, to their API, getting my information, and then I steal the data key, the stream key. That's their like secret Streamable API key. And it's uh, you, you just have to specify with credentials true. It's even less code. This is jQuery. It's less code. <coughs> excuse me. With the new uh, fetch. Uh, JavaScript API. So, so it's like trivially easy. You just have to send the HTTP request and it just works. If, if someone has misconfigured their, their, and so, um, uh, but how bad is it? How bad is it for everyone else? How bad is it in the Alexa 1 million? Is, is it a big problem? And the answer is it's a huge problem. Really big. Um, so, um, how do I know? So I scan for it. I specifically, I scanned. I sent an origin header with the words myevilsite.com, uh, and then uh, I looked for these two things: access control allow origin my evil site and access control allow credentials true. I followed all the redirects that I got and uh, checked both HTTP and HTTPS, and the results uh, were 1,514 sites in the Alexa 1 million had turned off security, um, which is astounding. Uh, uh, it's kind of important to remember, though, that sites that are only serving static content, it's like not really an issue. This is really maybe like 750. It's really a big problem because uh, sites without user data, there's nothing to steal. So, uh, but it's pretty astounding. I'm going to publish the list in a couple weeks. Uh, we're, I'm just waiting for one of the companies to fix the problem. Uh, one specific company. And, uh, uh, but yeah, it's a lot of people, um, have this problem. And, even half of these, looking through it, it's like the Alexa 1 million, I'm sure, if you've ever looked at it, you maybe recognize the first 20, and then there's stuff you don't recognize. And like, once you get down to 200,000, it's like, you haven't, you, I, I really don't recognize any of the sites anymore. And so these are high traffic sites, new sites, all, all sorts of different things, all over the world that have turned security off. Um, which brings up a new problem is how do you disclose? <laughs> yeah, so the code it's, uh, it's, on GitHub. it's uh, public right now. It's all Go, and uh, since I'm a big gopher, uh, it's got a lot of slick concurrency patterns that are really nice, um, which I'll show you really fast. So I basically have a big this is some Go code. Uh, I have one Go routine. You can think of it as a thread. It's not really a thread, but you can think of it as one. And it's just reading file name. Uh, it's just reading site to scan and shoving it into uh, shoving it into this right here, which is a GoLang channel. And then I have uh, these are a bunch of worker uh, Go routines. Uh, that are reading from the channel right here and doing a scan. And then the scan just does a, does a HTTP, uh, request. And there's some tiny details there that you can check out in the code. Like I turned off SSL verification because who knows if I'm going to get an expired cert. And, uh, I did, uh, yeah, and then you have to set the headers, but it's pretty simple. It, it was less than, 80 lines of code, or less than 100 lines of code. Uh, yeah, this is the wrong link. This, this, this is the right link. Sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, this brings up a question for me is, what the heck do you do when you find 1,500 problematic configurations on a site? Uh, for, for 1,500 sites with this really problematic configuration, um, there's not really a mechanism in security for this. You might think like, okay, CVE, CVE is what this is for, but it's not. CVE 
uh, is not well suited for this kind of disclosure. Because it knows it's not in any specific software package. It's not, um, there's no one place that this problem came from. It came from people misunderstanding how cross-origin resource sharing is supposed to work. Uh, so kind of what I did was I went down the list and I hunted for names I recognized, like uh, I, re I looked for .io TLDs because I figured there's going to be startups that have this problem and they're usually very responsive, like the streamable CEO. They're, uh, they're usually very responsive, like I emailed the streamable CEO at 3 in the morning and he got back to me in uh, two minutes the first time I emailed him. So, so that's kind of why I stuck with startups and big companies. And, uh, yeah, I, besides that, I just, I really haven't even looked at the list. It's just really big. Um, yeah, so this isn't something I can get a CVE for. There are, like, HackerOne has this internet bug bounty thing, but that's not well suited for this because that's also for specific, that'd be like a heart bleed kind of problem. So there's, there's really nothing in security you can do except uh, kind of disclose, which is fine, but it, it might be nice. So, so I started hunting for where this problem came from, uh, like specific software packages that were introducing this problem. Uh, and uh, I noticed Sales.js, I've never used this, but it's a Node MVC framework. Uh, they kind of make it really easy to make this configuration. There's going to be a Node security bulletin about this released Monday uh, for sales. Uh, Rack Cores is a Ruby gem that makes this. So there's a Go library that's pretty popular that does this. There's two Go libraries. Um, and I, I want to look at a lot more of these and do more hunting. Um, but yeah, it was it was fairly easy to start tracking this problem down to the source of what libraries were introducing it. And it it's more more of them were bad than were good. More cores libraries that I looked at didn't do the right thing than did. So which is very scary. Uh, but nothing uh, beat my satisfaction compared to this. Uh, I, I thought, where else could this be coming from? And the answer is always Stack Overflow. There's always something wrong on Stack Overflow. So I Googled cores, like cores something Stack Overflow. And the very first one uh, was this, PHP. And they are reflecting this, the origin header for all origins. And have the credentials true turned on, and it looks very official. Like there's all this documentation. They have the RFC right here for how cores work. Like this is something. It's got 106 upvotes when I saw this and took the screenshot. And last night it had like 140. And and so it uh it's just uh bad information that is getting perpetuated. And um. Yeah, this was, this is still just so funny to me. And the best part about this is a comment on that where this Jules person, shout out to Jules, they perfectly and eloquently explain exactly the problem that, uh, this piece of code introduces. And this was 20, that's July 7, 2012. And I'll read it in case it's too small. Note that sending the HTTP origin value back as the allowed cookies, thus potentially stealing a session from a user who logged into your site then viewed an attacker's page. You either want to send star, which will disallow cookies, thus preventing session or the specific domains you wish, you w uh, for which you want the site to work. Uh, and that's better than I could have said it. Uh, so shout out to Jules in 2012 for, for calling this. But I just thought this was hilarious. Um, so uh, what is the point about me and the, all this ranting about um, cores and this specific problem? Um, who, what is the actual problem here? And the actual problem is just complexity. 
with how web application specs are currently getting written. They are getting crazy complicated, and cores uh, might have like the biggest security impact, but it uh, there's there's so many. So here's a screenshot from the cores RFC. Uh, we didn't cover cores because it, and in depth in this talk because it is six response headers and three HTTP request headers that are required to to explain. And that is too complicated. Like uh, these are this is something that was made for developers, but it's they they clearly were not thinking about developers when they created cores and wrote this RFC. And um so it should be way easier. They they clearly thought about this problem in advance because they invented this star thing with a, and said no cookies can be sent with star. Uh, but it's just complicated. It kind of reminds me of OpenSSL, how it's just like tons and tons of badness all all together. Uh, and cores is not alone in this. There are these are like the new hot security headers that everybody's talking about. There's like securityheaders.io, and which gives you a grade based on security headers, which is ridiculous. And, and they have uh, like CSP is a big one, content security policy, sub resource integrity, uh, HPKP, HTTP public, public key pinning, credential management isn't a header, uh, and HSTS tr transport security, and and these are exciting, and I don't know why application security people really love this stuff, because it's like, this is for the castles, not the, not the deflated bounce houses. Uh, cause it's, it's hard enough to even get the basics done and prevent cross-site scripting and have a good, uh, good way to mitigate CSRF. And and so this kind of stuff is like, it's cool to talk about and it's cool that it exists, but it's kind of getting, it's gotten really big and really complex and for some reason everyone really wants to do it. And so content security policy, if you're not familiar, quick rundown. It's, uh, it was, it's supposed to be one header, but it's still three headers and some browsers don't support the one header. I'm not up to speed on who supports what, um, but it's a mess. And it has, it, it's growing every day. And uh, I really like learning about it, but it's uh, just a pain to keep up with and, and do all the reading about it. So uh, see it. content security policy is a way to provide a policy by HTTP response header that dictates what resources can load uh, from what origins and what paths and so you can say, I want my fonts to only load from my site over HTTPS from the fonts directory, which is nice, but um, there's a ton of other stuff you can do uh, that that's all getting new and being added. And uh, I personally love CSP because I put content security policy on the Cloudflare website, and now the marketing people have to come talk to me every time they want to add a new marketing integration. And so, so that is one great, I think, a great use for CSP. Uh, uh, yeah. So here's Mike West, who's a, uh, one of the authors of CSP, and he works on it daily at Google. Uh, super smart, crazy smart guy. And uh, but it just goes to show, like, this is getting complicated when the guy who wrote it says it's complicated, and. Uh, He's thinking maybe we should maybe we should do something about this. Uh, sub resource integrity. I don't want to talk about. Uh, <laughs> it's not a response header, so uh, I'm cheating. Uh, HTTP public key pinning. This is one that I think there has been people kind of sanity checking. Uh, we have seen this, and people aren't super gung ho about public key pinning because it's hard enough to keep a, a cert from expiring on your website, let alone keeping a, a HTTP response header in sync with the cert. So public key pinning is a is a 
is a HTTP response header where uh, clients that get this get this response header will only trust a, a small set of public keys that are set in this response header. And so uh, it's like trust on first use. You uh, you get this response header and uh, you you're kind of you're kind of uh, stuck with those public keys until they expire. And this is an operational burden. It's someone's gonna. There's been other talks about this. Um, I forget the guy's name, but like thought about hostile pinning and all sorts of weird stuff with this. I just care about like breaking my own site, and it's hard enough. So public key pinning. If you mess up with it. Your site could just be down for six months for everybody who went to it while you while you broke it. They would have to go in and clear their HTTP cache, and it would just be a nightmare. So, I think you've seen people kind of push back on this one. And here is Ryan Sleevy. Uh, he also worked on uh, this HPKP spec, and he kind of regrets it too. It's <laughs> it kind of it kind of got out of hand. HPKP is. Uh, it's scary. Uh, credential management. This is one I like to talk about because not many people have heard about it. There's a web app sec spec that is in your, your Chrome browser right now where there's a JavaScript function that you can call that will request, uh, basically your browser will do a login and take something that's stored in your Google Chrome password manager when it says, would you like to save this password? They, they created a AP, JavaScript API to call this function and uh, it'll log you in using that password. And like nobody's heard of this, nobody's looking at it and it's 20 page long spec of details about how it works and uh, it's super complicated and I'm afraid of this thing. Uh, and so it's scary. And HSTS, strict transport security, it's a way of uh, once you access a HTTPS site, they return this HT, HSTS header and you're stuck on HTTPS. Your browser knows only HTTPS. Uh, and this, this is like well accepted as a good header. I think people are, people, uh, people have kind of come to terms that the web should be encrypted and TLS should be default. And so it's super normal to see, and Google kind of really wants you to do include subdomains. They really want you to say, okay, uber.com is HTTPS only, but also demo.uber.com, m.uber.com, and all these other, every subdomain available. If you say include subdomains, then they're all uh, HSTS in. And uh, this is a screenshot from uh, Google has a HSTS preload list, so your browser maintains this big JSON file of every site that it knows is HTTPS only. Uh, and Google, it's just a giant file with names in it. And here's Uber, they must have had some operational issue. They asked to be removed from the list after uh, they had a, I don't know what happened, but they, they, <laughs> clearly did not want to support HSTS anymore uh, for for all their subdomains. So it's, uh, if Uber, who, they may, they may not be a castle yet, because they just like sprung up and hired like thousands of people really quickly, uh, but if Uber still has trouble with it, it's like maybe a lot of other people have trouble with HSTS too. It's not as easy as it looks. So what I'm preaching is usable security and web app sec specs need to become more usable. And uh, the target for web app specs and all these uh, RFCs that are getting pushed out need, needs to be developers. And anything, I guess everything coming from app sec people, uh, developers consume it. And so I guess we just have to keep that in mind. Um, it's also kind of kind of strange that these these RFCs are produced and 
it's a, like a contract where this thing is going to be supported for years and years and years to come by your browser, whether you like it or not. And, and so there's, there, there should be more people looking at this. There should be more people who care and who speak up and say, this is a bad idea. Uh, but, uh, so yeah, who remembers OpenSSL? This reminds me of OpenSSL. Uh, and so I'm, I, I don't like it. So TLS 1.3, if I'm not a TLS person, but I think TLS 1.3 did something very notable that's worth mentioning. Uh, they, TLS has been plagued with all these security, uh, security problems for years, uh, but, but they get patched, but they're, they're always noteworthy. And TLS 1.3 has been trying to take this into account as they formalize what TLS 1.3 will be. And they have tried, there's some good, there's some bad things, I think, in TLS 1.3, but one very good thing is they've limited the set of cipher suites that are allowed. And so you don't have problems of people just picking horrible cipher suites. There's only a couple allowed, and you either support them or you don't. And I think that's a big step forward because gave people the opportunity to be insecure, they were taking the opportunity to be insecure with the way TLS was set up in previous versions. So I think that one thing is a really positive thing. And so I think it should be easier to make a castle. And so where do we go from here? Uh, web specs are hard. I think they should be made easier, like a lot easier. And I think they need to be more developer focused. I think cores needs a full rewrite because it, it's just too confusing. Uh, CSP is complicated. Uh, SRI, we didn't talk about that. Yeah, I, just, I would love more people to be involved with the spec, the web app spec space, reading these things and understanding them and pushing back on and slowing, slowing their role as they, uh, as they pump out these new RFPs by the, by the quarter. It's usually like one a quarter or something. It's pretty rapid, I think. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to make it easy. And uh, thanks for coming to my talk. And uh, if you uh, would like to help make the web better, Cloudflare is looking for people to, to make it better. Because uh, this stuff is really hard. Thank you. Oh, and does anybody have questions? Yeah, so CVE database I think is uh, more well suited for specific versions of software problems. And this is a misconfiguration. And so it's not, I don't think it's well suited. It's like, if you do this bad thing, then there will be a bad consequence. Uh, uh, so. Yeah, that, oh, and, uh, the, for the record, her question was, why, why don't I get a CVE for this? Um, yeah, I, I, I could look more into it, but I, I haven't. I don't like CVE database. Yeah, this should definitely be something that, like, every scanner. Yeah, CWE would, yeah. That would make sense. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys.